<laughs> What's going on? Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you doing tonight? I can't complain. Look, I'm excited to be on here with you tonight. I'm excited to be here. I know we have a couple. Huh? I would say congratulations on everything that you're doing. I think it's an amazing platform and an amazing opportunity to um, hear the stories and the lives of other people that, you know, have to deal with life out the sports. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad to have this platform that I can be able to interview great people such as yourself, just for you guys to be just authentic and tell your story and, uh, and, and trust me to be able to ask the correct questions so that you guys can be able to, uh, you know, just explain to people about life after sports and that transition. I think it's important. A lot of people, um, they take it for granted or they don't, they really truly don't know um, the impact from leaving a sport that you probably played for nine, 10, 11 years for those who made it to play that long, then to transition to another career. And the motto for our, uh, for our podcast talks about when one career ends, another whole set of opportunities, a whole new set of opportunities begin. And so, uh, yes, it's this podcast is about sports and, and talks about that. But I think that that model goes for uh, anything in life, just in general. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's get started. I mean, Life After Sports podcast with Kevin Johnson. Uh, the theme for tonight is talking about sports and politics. And we have our special guest, Tamara James, Commissioner Tamara James, uh, former, MB former WNBA player and as well as former mayor uh, she's currently the commissioner of Dania Beach, and I'm excited that this is going to be episode 15, the final episode for our season one, and I wanted to finish it off with you. <laughs> Save the best for last. I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. 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 So, I mean, I, it's an honor to be able to, to interview you, and uh, just, you know, as we are about to dive into this, I, I want you to just talk a little bit about your, your upbringing, you know, where you were born and raised. So um, born and raised in the city of Dane Beach, uh, for those who don't know where that is, that is a smaller city in between um, the city of Fort Lauderdale and the city of Hollywood. Um, you know, I was raised by uh, in a two parent household that had adversity and, you know, they had their struggles. I wasn't raised with a silver spoon, but my parents always made sure that the spoon had something on it. And um, it's just amazing to see now how fundraising and, and AAU and those types of sports, how they are now versus how they were. I was just talking with my best friend, Tanya, and telling her, like, we used to have to stand on the corner and um, ask for money to, uh, at the corner of a McDonald's in order to just go to AAU trips. And, like, now, like, teams are sponsored. And, you know, uh, we, we really understood how to make something out of nothing. Yeah. And I think that's why we value so much now because we've been on every level of it. We weren't, we weren't giving a, an executive position. We weren't giving a, you know, a director position. You know, we had to start from the bottom and work our way up, just like a lot of small businesses here. And so I think um, growing up in a small town <clears throat> to where not a lot of success stories come out of there, um, where you have drugs and violence um, and being able to survive your, your circumstances and um you know survive your community and, and be able to go back and and give back and make sure that you're pouring back into that same community i think um it's empowering it's empowering and i think that um, it's definitely necessary because a lot of people leave the hood and they never return home absolutely absolutely i mean we, I, I know people who have you know <laughs> um and uh and those communities that help them help raise them or, or that village you know, they decide to go on, and, and which is understandable, but, you know, you still want to be able to uh, impact that, impact your, your neighborhood, impact the place that raised you um, to leave a legacy at some point. And so uh, talking about that, how supportive uh, has your parents been uh, in regards to your adolescent journey? Like, how supportive has your mom and dad has been? I mean, I wouldn't be here without them. I, I come from um, two parents that, that played sports that had to sacrifice um, giving up their careers in order to have a family. And um, I don't think they missed a game. And uh, luckily I stayed home uh, during college. I went to the University of Miami, which was like a 30 minute drive and they didn't miss a game. And even when I was out of town, they were they would sit in the cars and um, listen to the game on the radio. They've been so supportive. Um, nothing that I've asked for that they can give, 
they didn't give. Um, yeah. That's their time, their effort, their money. Um, I remember my, my parents, you know, forfeiting paying bills just so I can have basketball shoes. Wow. So I, I am who I am because of my village and definitely because of the support of my family. Yeah. And, and talking about support of your family, I mean, it takes a village to raise to raise a child. You know, it, it really, it really, it really does. And you see that now, you know, I know you, you have a son and you're, you're at those games as well, cheering him on. <laughs> I'm a crazy parent. <laughs> I used to hey. so my mom come to games and like screaming and, and yelling at me at the free throw line. And like, I'm that parent now. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to put like music over his videos because you hear me in the background, it's so embarrassing, but um, he's gonna get all of that. <laughs> I was gonna say that um, you probably there was probably a time when your parents were doing that and screaming and shouting when you were playing, and now that you are on the other spectrum, uh, have you tried to tame it because you know how your parents were to you, or you're like, look, I'm just gonna let that energy flow. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do what what feels natural because I want to support my son and let him know that I'm out here cheering him on. You know, um, being an athlete, you kind of understand like the ups and downs of games, and you kind of understand like. Um, how how the game is played and in the roles the different roles that different staff members uh, and the people apart that are part of the organization what they have um and so as long as my son is giving effort i, I don't you know I'm, I'm really excited when he scores or when he's playing well and I, i'm that hype man for him i'm definitely his biggest cheerleader on the sidelines but i try to allow the coaches to do their job i try to allow the coach to allow the coaches to do their job um, because I, I know in, in coaching and volunteering and understanding uh, how that could feel. But yeah. as long as my son is – now, if my son is not giving effort, I probably would go on the field and snatch him up because, yeah. you know, I'm I'm just not built like that. Yeah. No, and look, I get it. Look, I, I get it, especially with your resume. I totally understand that. Um, <laughs> when did you start playing sports? Oh, my gosh. Um, there's a photo that my mom has, and I think I, I had on a – I may have had on a diaper or, you know, really young and um, shooting at like this, this toy goal and, and in my, in my room. So I would think like around the age of two, I've been around yeah. basketball, like literally my whole life. Wow. 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 Um, what was your motivation at such a young age um, while your parents, when I say groom, you just groom you to, to be the person that you are today. But in regards to your involvement with sports, like what was your motivation? Well, my dad um, was still playing in leagues in some of uh, in some of the Native American leagues, and so I, I was a daddy's girl, and I just, you know, followed him to all of the you know all of the games. Um, but basketball ended up, you know, from what I can remember, it ended up being an outlet for me. Um, going through my adolescent years, you know, being confused and and understanding the development and not understanding, you know, not being popular, not being this person, it really was an outlet for me. Um, and so I found solace in basketball. And I, and I didn't know how good I was. I just know I wanted to play. And I was very competitive. And so um, all I knew is that I love to play the game of basketball. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your journey in regards to high school. You know, um, while you played at high school, uh, you're, you played at South Broward High School. Let's talk about your experience there. Um, <clears throat> and the things you guys accomplished as, uh, while you were there as well. So I came into South Broward as a freshman, and they had just come off of winning the state championship. And so there was a lot of pressure on us. Um, I didn't know that I was going to play varsity. I just, again, knew that I wanted to be a part of, of the dynasty of someone from the community. They just won a state championship. It was, it was huge in our community. And so while my sister went to a different school, I, I, I lied on um, you know, my address, I used my grandmother's address so that then it wasn't a choice school. And so, yeah. so I would be able to go to South Broward. And, um, you know, I was very impactful in my, my freshman year. I think I led the team in scoring. We were undefeated and had the big head and um, we lost uh, the game to go to state. Um, and then we won the next three championships. I was MVP of every state championship game. Oh, wow. um, playing basketball in high school, it was almost like being in college. Uh, there, there was, you know, Coach Abby Ward and Coach Richard Walker were so instrumental in the development of me as a player and um, developing my mental toughness and developing, you know, being able to put a team on my back. And yeah. I think it was then to when I really understood like how to take over a game. And, you know, I was just still so raw and, and, and I wasn't fine tuned, but 
um, you can't take the dog out of a person. And that's something that, you know, any college is going to want to recruit. Um, someone that you don't have to coach effort, someone that you don't have to coach being a good teammate, someone that you don't have to coach, you know, leaving your all on the court. And that was something that I did. I, I, I got the most of my points from running the floor and rebounding. And so yeah. it wasn't like I had to do all these fancy moves. It was just, you know, I, I wanted the ball more than my opponent. Wow. Wow. Well, talking about you wanted the ball more than your opponent, um, let's talk about the transition when you went to uh, University of Miami and why you chose University of Miami. So, again, um, you know, my parents weren't real versed in, in the recruiting game. Um, I was the only athlete at that time, you know, uh, in our family. And um, so I received a lot of um, attention uh, I was being heavily recruited by everyone. My my junior year, I tore my ACL, and then a lot changed after that. And then I think also in my junior year, um, nine eleven happened. Yeah. And although I was selected to be a McDonald's All American, you know, you had to go to New York City, and it, there was just no way I was going there. And nine eleven scared me straight. I thought that we were going like World War Three. <clears throat> I just thought that the world and the economy was going to, you know, it was going to be a mess. And so. I opened my first University of Miami collegiate letter. And at that time, they weren't a great team. Um, yeah. They had been a really good team in the past, but they, they just weren't a great team with football school at that time. Uh, I went down there on my visit. I refused to get on the plane. And I, so I only took one visit to the University of Miami. And me being naive and my parents being wooed about being in a fancy hotel, I committed on the visit. And <laughs> that, was, that was it. You know, my mom asked some really tough questions to you know the the coaches but yeah. i don't think that we really was educated in understanding what it really is to to be recruited um so i was i guess i was the guinea pig of of, of our family and of, of a lot of people in our communities to really understand what really goes into choosing a school yeah but i, I wouldn't take it back i mean you know we got slapped my freshman year in college. We probably lost more games my freshman year in college than I lost my entire high school, you know, career. And it, it, I had to get used to a different type of mindset. You know, you went to a party school. You definitely just, you know, be losing at by 20 in the locker room. And my teammates are talking about going to the club after the game. And, you know, wow. me being the competitor that I am, I'm like, we're losing by 20, you know. Yeah. So it was just a different mindset. We had a lot of girls that, wanted to play, but I don't think we had a lot of girls that really wanted to play at the next level. Yeah. And so, um, you know, playing in college, I really had to channel my thoughts of where I really wanted to go after college and, and my mission. And um, I just went out there to, to kill everything in front of me because I knew that it wasn't going, we weren't going to get the notoriety of being a top five, top 10 school in the nation. Yeah. And so, you know, being the, you know, one of the high scores in the nation tied for number one, that's what caught the attention of a lot of people because you can say that, okay, your school isn't that, that good um, because you scoring all the points, but when you're scoring the same amount of points against the UConn's, when you're scoring the same amount of points against the Rutgers, the Georgias, you know, those, those really good schools, um, you're doing something. And, and that's how <laughs> I was able to get the attention, you know, of scouts and it, cause, because it definitely wasn't, um, it definitely wasn't our, our record. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, talking about that, I mean, you, you, you set the tone uh, at the University of Miami. Uh, talk about how did you, um, in regards to the records that you broke. Uh, I already know you were Hall of Fame. You were Hall of Fame at the University of Miami. But talk about the records that was set, that you set. And, and just the, the feeling of when you were done and you graduated, you're like, man, I didn't, like, so you could talk about the transition and knowing, like, damn, I'm about to break this record or I'm about to set this. Like, talk about that whole process. I'm not really the type of person that's, like, into all of these accolades. Like, I just yeah. want to play. And, um, you know, I don't have the record for the most amount of points in the game. I think uh, another another player has that. But coming um, into it, I, I know that uh, Maria Rivera and Francis Savage were two of the top players to come through that program. And I know my senior year, um, I was really close to breaking that record. And um, I had such a selfless team to where they were literally counting down the points, you know, having on the side, like, oh, okay, 100 more points, 99 more points. And we got down to like one more point, you know, my, my teammate had a breakaway layup. Someone who, her, Amy Otterberg, I would never forget her. She, she 
didn't play that often unless we were, you know, up a lot in, in games and things like that. But she was so selfless. And instead of her scoring a layup, you know, they wanted me to break that record. She passed me the ball. And I didn't understand how significant that really was until you're like out of the situation and you don't understand how big it is to break that type of a record yeah. until you're out of the situation. Um, but definitely, I am the all-time leading scorer of both men and women at the University of Miami. Wow. Um, and my jersey is retired, and I am in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, I say those things, and, and I really, I still don't really understand the magnitude mm -hmm. of it. Uh, you don't really understand those things until, because it just wasn't that important to me. Yeah. Um, everyone else talks about, oh, my gosh, you're this, you're that. And I'm like, listen, I put on my drawers just like y'all put on y'all. And so um, <laughs> that's how I view myself. Uh, I don't... <laughs> You know, I'm not here to be politically correct. I'm just saying. No, I know. We, have, we all have the same 24 hours. Um, and I, I've never been that person. I, I broke so many records at South Broward and all throughout my career. And I just really walk around just like I'm the average Joe Blow because that's truly how I feel. You know, I put in the work. Um, and uh, I have a, a lot of pictures and, and, and murals and things like that uh, at the University of Miami. I'm forever grateful for the program and what it means to really be a, a Miami hurricane. And there, it, there's always love between me and the University of Miami. They always show me love. And, you know, I always interact with the girls after that come after me. And, you know, Coach Katie Meyer has really turned the program around to, to really be a place to want to go and play. Yeah. And you, and you continue to go back and speak to the new players. Um, I think that's important. You're you're always active. You know, you have players who come and they break records or whatever. They come through a program and they never go back. You're always giving back. I I love it. I, I love um, because I didn't have that. Yeah. And so I, I I love being able to show them that I am no different than them. You know, I love being able to to relate to other players and you know it's never scheduled i'll just come and you know coach kept like oh go talk to the girls or, or, or something of that nature and i actually used to go and play with them until i got too old and one of the post players like gave me a forearm to the chest and i was like wait i'm not i'm not on a college plan anymore i'm not living waste like that i'm just staying from the sidelines and kind of like encourage y'all from here um because uh they're getting bigger and stronger you know i was yeah. a post player and i'm undersized and, yeah these girls are huge and very talented now. And so yeah. um, I, I, I love going back to the University of Miami. I love bringing my son and, and my god kids and, and even our children in our community. Now I have it to where we bring busloads of kids and just let them experience going to a college game because a lot of our kids in our community, they haven't been past Fort Lauderdale. They yeah. haven't been past their communities and they don't understand the opportunities that really exist outside of their neighborhoods. No, and I and I agree with you. I mean, having doing those things so that they can be able to see the opportunities is is definitely giving back to your community, but really instilling knowledge in these kids and letting them know, hey, I did it, you can do it, and and uh, and it's not that far off. Um, in this conversation, we're talking about pre career, in career, and post career. So let's dive into your uh, in career. Um, talk about your experience drafted, your experience being drafted in the WNBA. Huh. <clears throat> Um, it was like that. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was a crazy ride. I didn't even know that scouts were like coming to the games and you know, to my coach before one game was like, Listen, the scout for the Washington Mystics is here and I'm like, Why would you say that? Like now I'm gonna go out and you know, I'm gonna have the jitters. But um going to the pre draft and being a part of that experience is something that all little girls you know, who play basketball is their dream. Yes. It's it's not the it's not the money that's the dream, it's being able to play, you know, at that platform in America, um, in front of your family and your friends is just such an accomplishment. And so um, when I went to Boston, because the draft was in Boston that year, yeah, me and Sherelle Baker, we, uh, we got on the wrong bus and we almost missed the draft. Are you serious? Uh, we got on the city bus. All the buses look the same, you know, and um, we're in Boston and you have like a whole lot of buses and you don't know where to go and you just get on the bus, you see everyone else get on the bus, you get on the bus. And then when the, as soon as we got on, like the bus closed and we're like going, I'm like, Sherelle, I think we're on the wrong bus. And so I almost missed the draft. And um, thank God I did not miss the draft. Um, I was supposed to go fifth but they made a trade and the Washington Mystics ended up moving to the eighth pick. And so that's how I was drafted. 
um, the eighth pick. It was such a surreal experience because you see it on TV. The, you know, you're sitting at the table with your family. You yeah. wait for the big moment. You, you hope they're going to call your name. Um, and they call your name and, and your life changes. Um, you know, that it's just a, it's a feeling that I can't explain, but it's a feeling of, of joy and satisfaction and that hard work really pays off because there's no way you can cheat that. You can't cheat your way into the WBA <laughs> at a draft. And so yeah. um, being drafted there, you know, um, I came into it. My coach told me I wasn't going to get much playing time. And um, I, I didn't care anything about that. I was like, yes, I am. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat somebody at the spot and not knowing, you know, the politics involved in that. And yeah. I really wasn't going to get any playing time. Don't matter who I was better than, no matter who I outworked, I, I just did not understand that. And I did, I did not like that about the WNBA. I did not like the fact that it didn't matter how hard you work. In the situation that I was in, I wasn't going to play in front of the person, you know, ahead of the person that was before me. And um, it broke my spirit. Yeah. Because I, I, I thought that it was an opportunity. I thought being drafted to the WNBA in in my situation meant that it was an opportunity for me to really showcase my talent. Being a Absolutely. first round draft pick, you don't think that you're gonna sit on the bench. And and I've never sat on the bench in my life. I've been a captain of almost every team I've been on. Um I've been the leading scorer. I've been that person. And when you've been that person all your life and you work hard and it doesn't pay off. You don't really know how to adjust to that adversity. Yes. And being immature, I, I didn't adjust well. I, I was depressed. I, I just didn't. I didn't. I stopped playing hard. Um, it took me to like All Star break when I went home, and I was like, "Look, I'm gonna go overseas and play." So I made my practices my game. Mm. And so I knew I wasn't gonna play the game. So I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna bust it behind and practice every practice." <laughs> And the vets hated me for it. It was like, why are you playing so hard? And I'm like, I'm trying to get better. I want to play. I want to, you know. Um, I had an attitude. Uh, I didn't. I didn't handle things the right way, and that followed me. And 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 that 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 made a label for me that I was unable to escape. And yeah. you know, following that year, the second year, you know, I started. I was starting sometimes, and sometimes I wasn't. And it was a lot of politics involved in it. And I was just over it. It, it wasn't. It wasn't as enjoyable. I loved my teammates. Yeah. Um, I loved the relationship that we had. But you know, seeing what it was. Like you have some people that went to different situations where they had all rookies, and so you can really fight for a spot. Correct. But Jones, you know, an Olympian, in a beer, you know, Olympian. You're on the team with, you know, Chastity Melvin, and um, and Nakia Sanford. Um, you're on a team with, with some high-powered people. Yeah. Uh, there's very little there. You know, I'm like, well, dang, you want me to pass up my shot for your shot, and I'm hoping you have someone on you. But that's the expectation. You kind of got to get in where you fit in. It, it's very demanding. And yeah. um, if you're not tough, it's a sink or swim type of situation. And um, so I, I didn't have a, an, a, an enjoyable time with the WNBA, to be quite honest with you. Um, I, I I appreciate the platform that they have for women, and Absolutely. some women love it, and some some women hate it. And um, it was an honor to be there, to be able to be you know to play in front of fans um, that you know that that were diehard fans. Um, and absolutely, it taught me a lot about life because it really taught me about going through adversity. I'm not talking about an injury adversity, going through a lot of adversity about like life is not going to stop because you don't get your way. You know, how Absolutely. you respond to that adversity. And I didn't respond well. I was like telling the GM and the coach, like, I'm not going in the game with two minutes left. Y'all not going to treat me like I suck. Like, this was me. <laughs> and and I wish I can. And I regret that. You know, people say they have no regrets. I regret that because. Yeah there were better ways to handle the situation and I didn't take advantage of that. And I didn't know, I didn't know any better. You know, you know yeah. better, you do better. And so they got well, all of Danny Beach in me. <laughs> well, look, the, the, the crazy thing, and it's not even a crazy thing, the, the thing when you look back, and I, I think we all do it, when we look back on our lives, we're like, man, if I could have been able to change that moment, I don't know what the trajectory would have been in my life if I was able to make that change. But also when you look at the, the teams that you played on and 
the work ethic that you've put in all, along those years, it's hard when you get to that level now to make a, a different dramatic change or, or eat a humble pie or, hey, even though we know you're talented, you're not going to play. That is such an adjustment. That's an adjustment for anybody. It is. And, you know, I have my teammates that really try to, you know, let me understand. And there was no understanding. I don't understand how you go from, like, leading the nation and scoring and then sitting at the end of the bench. I, I didn't understand that. And I didn't have a very understanding coach at the time either that yeah. really tried to help me understand that. I had some really understanding teammates. But, you know, when you come from a place to where – this is all I have. I have no no fallback plan. I, this is all I knew. This is my only way to get out the hood. You know, um, I can't disappoint my family. I can't disappoint my friends. Like having my, my my family fly up and watch me sit on the bench. Like that was. Those were some very tough times. But guess yeah. what? Basketball has molded me so yeah, much. So it's much. made my skin so thick. It's taught me accountability. It's taught me responsibility. It's taught me teamwork. It's taught me effort. It's taught me everything that I have needed to prepare me for life after sports. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your transition, uh, the transition of you playing um, from the WNBA, but then transitioning to playing basketball overseas. So let's talk about uh, how different was your experience overseas than it was in the WNBA. Well, like the WNBA, um, you know, I, at that time, in 2006, I was the eighth pick, and I think um, my salary was $40,000. Wow. And, you know, you have players that go overseas and make fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in a month. Mm. And so, every, mostly, unless you're like a, a Maya Moore type of player, Sylvia Fowles type of player, <laughs> Candace Parker type of player, um, you're going to need to go overseas because that's where you're going to get your money. Yeah. And overseas is different because you don't have so many Americans per team and um, you are the man on the team. Yeah. And you play once a week. If, you, if you're in the Euro League or the Euro Cup, you, you play twice a week. And it's just a different level of expectation. Now, it's it's, it's tough overseas as well because if, if you do not perform, there is no, okay, next season we're not going to bring you back. It might, they they it send might you home. That maybe that night, okay? Mm, and mm. It's, you know, it's it's real, it's really tough. And you know, you get paid once a month, and what happens when they don't pay you? Yeah. And 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 that's and that's reality. It's reality when you go overseas, and you know, um, depending on your team, they don't really care if you're injured. They want to know, can you play? Can you produce um, now? Yeah, absolutely. But I love the tradition um, and, and the relationships that I forged overseas. Um, I miss I miss that part of it. I don't miss the management part of it. Um, I love the fact that I was able to have my son overseas with me for three years, wow. uh, for him to experience the culture of Israel and and to to bond and to you know not even have to deal with like racism and, and the things that we have to worry about in America, but for him to, to just be free and, and, and to just experience things that people read in the Bible that would never experience in their lives. Wow. And so um, I played overseas for about nine, 10 years, and um, I, I won two cup championships. I won one league championship in, in Israel, and it, it's, a, it's a surreal feeling because they have real fans. Like, we think we have fans in the NBA because we have a little DJ. No, they have real fans. They have their drums. They have their horns. They have chants for every player. Like, they have real support. They and, and, you know, sold out support, depending on what country you go to or what wow. team you play for. And, um, you know, that was my WNBA <laughs> for me. You know, that was, that was me being able to play for a living, you know, travel yeah. the world, I love basketball took me all over the world and taught me so much about so many different cultures and it and it opened up my mind. I was very closed minded and it really opened up my mind to so many things and I'm I'm forever grateful for it. That's good. I mean talk about that uh that feeling of winning that uh that chip at uh, the Israeli league chip. Oh my gosh. Um <laughs> if you can remember that, I mean it wasn't that long time ago. I can remember because we went up against some some very good players. I mean it was uh, Sade Houston and, and um, Danielle Adams and uh, Ashley Shields. I mean, it was like David versus Goliath. I think it was after I had my son and I came back to play and we had a, a team full of, I would call, misfits because we were all um, not on the decline, but we were all 
on that team because something didn't happen, right? For me, it was trying to redeem myself after having a baby. For other people, it may have been an injury, but um, we were very good players, but no one really be believed in us. And I remember um, the owner telling us, okay, you know, um, we want you all to play and we don't expect much out of you. Just don't come in last place. Oh, wow. That's the expectation that we walked into. I literally, I was in Germany, um, with my son's father and then I I flew it was an opportunity I flew to Israel uh at night I got a physical that night and I practiced that night off the plane the next day we had a game mm. and 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 it just kind of took off from there and throughout that season we really found ourselves um you know we had a chip on our shoulder because no one believed in us because all of the big names had just left that team and we ended up slaying Goliath we ended up beating a team that no one expected that of us and we ended up beating them yeah. and um it was the most exhilarating feeling because i'm the type of person i love being the underdog i love proving people wrong mm -hmm. um that's what i've done my entire life and so for me it was just me lacing up my shoes and going out there and killing whoever in front of me literally yeah. that's that's how i took it and um uh, and everyone else like we just grew together and we were pretty we were really good that year and uh it it was it was a feeling of gratification and um understanding that you know you can't cheat the grind and yeah. you get getting out what you put in and and, and it was just a, a real satisfaction that you know went throughout my body and and crazy celebration i've i've never been a part of those types of celebrations in my life like i've won championships <laughs> in high school and all this other stuff but, but that was different yeah these fans on another level so my my question to you: Who who else was on your team at that moment? Yeah, Alex any other? Hightower. Okay. Um, Whitney Body started the season with us, and then uh, we had Kayla Jones, who was like the vet of the team. Uh, myself, and then Brittany. I can't even remember her last name. Oh my gosh, I'm a horrible teammate. How many Amer How many Americans y'all had on that team? We have four. Okay. Four Americans on that team, and uh, yeah, it. Allison Hightower went to LSU, and she really didn't know how great she was, but she ended up being unstoppable. Like, wow. she amazed me. And Kayla, you know, she brought her her wisdom to the game, you know, and um, she was like the mama of the team. She was a little older. As a matter of fact, she retired off of that. Like, it was it was an amazing season. It was amazing wow. for her. Yeah, and she, you know, she played in, with the Mystics as well. And so I knew her from playing with her at the Mystics. And I hadn't seen her in so long and, you know, came back together. People are not thinking that, oh, she's old. Oh, she's slow. She's this. Oh, she's that. She knew the game. Yeah. And sometimes, um, you know, you can outsmart a person when they think that they know it all. You know, when you, you have the younger, uh, energetic players, but then you have uh, experienced players that really know the game, you know, it can take you far. That's why it's always great, um, and I'm speaking from a coach's aspect, it's always good to have that balance on a team. You know, you have a little bit of vets, you have some young some young players so that they can be groomed by the vets, but everybody brings something brings something different to the team or brings something different to the table. And the, and it's crazy how you said that the management at that time, they, you know, they was like, just don't come in last place. But did your coach, did your coach have that same mentality at that time with management or it was different? No, my coach had a winning mentality. Like, it was like we were in college. Yeah. We were two days. Like, he had some schemes that, you know, we really had to buy into his system that made no sense. Like, some of the things, like, he, we would be up, and he wanted us to foul with, like, 30 seconds left. And I'm like, no, I'm not fouling. I'm going to play defense. You know what I'm saying? Like, why would I foul? And not understanding the game from a coach's Fair mindset. Point. But, you yeah. know, um, you feeling like they don't have the confidence in you. But a lot of, you know, I think back, like, a lot of the coaching mechanism that he did, like, it, it made a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, but he definitely, he, he expected us to win the championship the day we landed off the plane. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, that's that's great. I, I just wanted to ask that because, you know, hearing from management, hey, just don't come in last place, you know, that, that attitude could trickle down to the coach, to the players. Um, but I'm glad to know that he had a different uh, agenda for you guys. And you guys went ahead and, and won the chip. So, I mean, that that was important uh, at that time. Now, making a segue into your post-career, what was, um, while playing in the professional, 
professional uh, basketball overseas. Did you ever think about what my life is going to be after sports? Uh, and I know it's different for everybody. Some people think about it. Some people don't think about it. But what was what, what was your stance on that? I thought I was going to be a college coach. I thought I was going to go back to the University of Miami. And I thought I was going to coach. And I thought I was going to just, you know, develop players and um, build them up to being what I was or even better than who I was. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> I had a I had a son and, and that was the reason one of the reasons why I stopped playing. He was getting to the age to where he needed stability. He not traveling from team to team every year, country to country and um he needed to go to an American school and injuries, you know, and surgeries. I, I was barely walking out the games and stuff. Like, um I, I had to see what kind of quality of life I wanted. And so I didn't know what I was gonna do. Actually yeah. I, I I um I went home for the summer and it, it was a it was a really stressful year overseas that year for me with the management of things and I just didn't want my son to have to deal with certain things. Um, I got a job uh, at, at the port uh, with marketing and 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 do, planning events and I was like, oh, I'll just do this during the summer because um, I was no longer playing in the WNBA and then. Um, some of my mentors who was one was the mayor at the time walter duke and one of the commissioners bobby grace first african-american female mayor in the history of our city wow. um they were like you need to they have been telling me for like five years like you need to run for me i'm like yeah i lost your mind i will never get into politics i'll be in jail like i can't i can't do it there's no way i can do it that was my attitude you know not with my mindset i just wasn't ready to do it and yeah um, I've had a nonprofit since 2007, and that allowed me to continue my relationship with the city and have to go there and, and know how local government worked. And I didn't like the leadership there. And it was a bullying mentality there. And me being me and being impulsive, I, I got upset when, at one of the meetings, and I was just like, I'm going to run for your seat because that's not how you treat people. And I'm going to teach you how to treat people. Mm. That's not how it goes. And I was like, Mom, what did I just do? And she was like, you just announced that you're 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 running you're running <laughs> <laughs> and i was like so what do i do first and literally you know they wrapped their arms around me my mentors my community and they pushed me and i did the only thing i know how to do is compete is compete and that's how i won i i didn't go with this big laundry list of oh i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do this no i just want to serve you and that's yeah. what I told people. Like, I just want to serve you. I've been serving this community all my life. I, I am born and raised in this community, and um, I outworked my opponents. You know, I, I worked so hard when they were sleeping. A lot of my opponents were a little older, um, so <clears throat> I had that advantage. Uh, you know, when I was elected, I think I was 31, and the person that was the next was like 60. Wow. And so, you know, there was there's a big difference. Big difference. A big age difference. And so I, I knew that in order to win, you have to you have to you have to outwork your opponents. And so that's what I did. And then I ended up receiving the most amounts of votes in the history of Daniel Beach. Um wow. just by authentically, unapologetically being who I naturally am. Wow. Wow. Um <laughs> talk about winning. Like I'm looking at your life as you're explaining and, and giving me detail it just shows being resilient <laughs> resiliency and then just having the passion to just win like you're just the competitive nature no matter what and so when i i was getting ready to ask you the question about your involvement in, in contemplating uh politics it just it's it, you just showed it i didn't like how they were treating the people and i need to let them know look it needs to be something different we need to make a difference here and it's a way that you do it and for you just to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to throw my name in a hat. I, look, I didn't know what I was really doing, but I know that I can make change. And I know there's a, a way that I can go about doing it that just uh, attests to your uh, desire to uh, to be a change agent. Yeah, um, literally, that's just what it that's what it was. I've, I've always I've always felt like if you're going to complain, you have to be willing to do something. Yeah. And, you know, be a part of the solution. And so that's what I did. You know, I just was like, I don't know how I'm going to get it done. And I, I am I am a shining example of God doesn't call, qualify. He qualifies the call. Mm. And I don't know why he closed every other door 
you know, I thought I was going to be a, a coach. Coach. Coach K told me, no, thank you. Um, not like that, but that situation just didn't work out. Yeah. I didn't want to travel outside of where my support system was because I had a three-year-old at the time. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I knew that's where my support was. Um, you know, at, at his father lives in Texas and I live in Florida. And so I had to weigh my options. God closed every other door but that door. And I was like, all right, God, well, you put me here, you're going you gonna to bring me through it. And, you know, I had faith, but faith without works is dead. And so yeah. I knew that I, I couldn't just say I was going to do it. I had to put forth some effort behind my, you know, behind my word. I had to put action behind it. And so um, all I knew was that those people were going to be sitting there at the next election. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, with your competitive nature um, and then the philanthropy that you've always done in the community, talk a little bit about your foundation, the Tamara James. Yeah, so um, the Tamara James Foundation was founded in 2007. And the reason why I founded it, you know, earlier I talked about, you know, my struggles as an athlete and coming from the inner city and not having um, the financial ability to be able to gain the same exposure as other as others and um, having to stand on the corners and have 15 hour drives just to, you know, possibly be seen at the next level. And I, I vowed that, you know, once I had the opportunity or, or the resources to be able to give back to other, you know, kids, because we have a lot of children that, you know, could have excelled in sports, but they didn't have they didn't have the financial capacity to be able to to experience those things. Yeah, and support. so that's what my foundation was kind of founded out, out of, you know, giving those scholarships or paying the way for people to just go to tournaments and to just to gain that exposure. And it's kind of morphed into, you know, being kind of the Robin Hood of the community. And so um, once a year, we have a Thanksgiving drive where we give out um, fresh produce. I mean, fresh collard greens and fresh green greens and sweet potatoes and onions and uh, you know, turkeys and, you know, miscellaneous items, everything you need for your Thanksgiving, you know, it's, it's grown and, it, and it's, we feed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families. And then, you know, we have our back to school um, event that we have over 2000 backpacks that's filled with school supplies wow. to ensure that our children are, are ready for the first day of schools. And we get all of the principals of the area to come in and interact with, you know, with the parents. And then we have a health fair and, you know, we partner with Memorial Hospital to provide immunizations for uninsured kids and adults. And um, we just bring all of the resources to the community because we know that, you know, the black community, you know, they lack a lot of the resources and they lack the ability to go out and and get those resources because yeah. they may not have the, you know, the funding or, or the finances to be able to get a vehicle. Um, and so having that, sound, like seeing parents and, and family so appreciative of just someone helping. You know, we all are looking for, and, and it might not be the person that's on government assistance, or, you know, it, it, it could very well be someone that just lost their job. Correct. And, you know, I always think that, I always know that we're all one decision away from a totally different life. Yeah. And I, I keep that in the back of my mind because I've watched my family struggle. I've watched my friends struggle. I've watched my community struggle. And so anything that I can do to like, you know, help and to just show them that, you know, there are people in this community that cares for them. Yeah. That's what my foundation does. Well, I mean, that's great, especially at a time like this with the whole pandemic and people, like you said, you're one situation away from you know not having a house not having food on the table not having this and with that being said it's just it's a lot going on especially for the inner city certain neighborhoods and i think with this pandemic it affects everybody people yeah. on different scales but it still affects people at home in fact my family i had a family member who passed away and it and it just it trickles and so um hopefully we you know as a country we figure this figure this out where you know the rates are not just going up quickly all the time but i mean something has to be done where we can be able to move on from this because this is something i've never seen this before i mean i don't think you've seen something of this nature has happened in the country before as well no one knows what's going on yeah you know, <laughs> I, the person in the white house don't know what's going on like no one knows what's yeah. going on and so yeah. you know you just have to be diligent and 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 do what's best for your family yeah um, talk about, and I know uh, I'm asking you all these questions, but uh, talk about the, the name, uh, the, the, you have a, a street named after you. Talk about how that all came about and 
Cause my mom's a beast. <laughs> well, Listen, look, it, t it, t it takes one to know one. So she's a beast. You, right. You're I'm a beast every, right after I'm her. Every piece of her. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of that. And so <laughs> look, my, my mom was like, no, like, um, my baby's going to, this street is going to be named after my baby. And I was overseas playing. I was like, whatever, mom, do what y'all got to do. And like, she, she got thousands of signatures. She went to the commission meetings. She pushed for it, you know, um, Everyone was really supportive in, our, in my community because I was the neighborhood hero. You know, I won all these state championships. I went to college. I went to the WBA. I have a foundation. I'm playing overseas. And, it, you know, it was just a shining example for this community of, of the possibilities. And I'm so glad that they, you know, the community chose to give me my roses while I'm living. Because you don't see that often. You know, you, you have street names out of people when, when they die. They're not yeah. the person, you know, of course. And so I was pregnant. It was 2011. I would never forget it. I was home for overseas and I was pregnant. I woke up and I walked out of my mom's house because it's the street that she lives on. And I knew that it had passed at the commission meeting. And um, I just saw the public services guy, you know, taking the stop signs down. I'm like, what are they doing? You know, I'm just drinking or eating outside. I'm like, what are they doing? I was like, oh my gosh, they're putting up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy. You know, I'm, my address on my license says 255 Northwest Tamara James Avenue. And so, and I'm Tamara James. So when I call in and I'm placing orders, a lot of times I place orders online, they'll call and they're like, I think you made a mistake on your address. And I'm like, no, I didn't make a mistake. Um, and it's, 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 it's unreal. Proud. It, it's really unreal. It makes me, <laughs> it makes me proud. You know, and it's something that my son can see something that my community and my, my God kids can see um, it's, it's a legacy and <clears throat> they just continue to give me my roses while I'm living. I also yeah. have a signal box that's right across the street from one of the schools that, you know, you know, now they're wrapping these signal boxes with art. And so um, I'm on a side of the signal box. And so, you know, explain the signal box to me because I don't know what that is. So the electrical boxes. So, you know, you, you ride down the street and you see these big old gray boxes and you don't yeah. know what they are, like 10, those boxes. So we have a lot of those in the city. So, you know, our arts department or creative arts council, they okay. wrap those for art. So they have an artist come and they tell them, you know, what area they wanted to come from. And then they bring whatever vision of life. And they brought it in front of the commission. Like, this is how we want the signal box. And I was like, I'm on it. You know, I'm the mayor. I'm on the signal box. I'm alive. You know, you know, you know what's so crazy? You have people saying like, what if she starts selling drugs? Or why would you put on a signal box before they die? Like, what if they what if they kill somebody? Wow! And and that's that's called being black in Dangy Beach and, and and in politics, honestly. Because why is that the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah. When 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 you're thinking of me, someone who already has a street named after him, you know, I my resume speaks for itself. I have the accolades, and people just don't want it to be you. Yeah. Sometimes they just don't want it to be you, and so um, I. It's, it's crazy that, you know, our kids can go outside of their school and walk down the street and see somebody that looks like them. Yeah, absolutely. See somebody that's in their community that comes and does work in their school and, and they're being honored while they're alive. While they're alive. So I, I am forever thankful for my city and for my community. Like, they have my back. Like, yeah. they have my back. Well, I got talking about having your back and, and, and uh, for those haters that you all, we always have haters that don't want us to succeed for whatever reason. Uh, what obstacles uh, have you overcome, you know, while being the mayor in Dania Beach? <sighs> so I know you, but where do I begin? I know, um, you know, being called little girl, oh, little girl, little girl. I'm like, no, I'm the mayor and, and, and I kind of beat you in the election. So kind of not like a little girl, but just having that respect as a 31 year old mayor, a young black um, boss that has employees that now like my mom has worked for the city for 17 years. Wow. And when I'm elected, I become her boss. And that's just hard for people to like kind of fathom. Like I'm like, hi mom. Uh, and you know, she's talking to me. I'm like, mm -mm, you know, I'm your boss. You can't talk to me. I'm like, girl, you better shut up. I'm like, okay, yes ma'am. <laughs> but um, the respect factor, um, it seems as if you don't have the credibility, regardless of your resume, you don't have the credibility because of your age and because other they don't respect your position. I, I, 
the professional disrespect is just uh -oh. It's it's un it's unreal, and me learning how to channel my emotions, and that's why I don't know if politics are going to be for me for the rest of my life because I can't bite my tongue. Literally, I, I I will sit in meetings and I will have my Apple Watch on and trying to bite your tongue and not say anything. And my Apple Watch is say your heart rate is your heart rate is going up a lot, and you are you are and you're not moving. And literally, what it shows you is that biting your tongue can kill you. Wow. Like, keeping all that in, like, is going to, if you don't know how to channel your emotions and deal with your issues, like, it causes health issues, like, real health issues. And not, you know, I, I'm always being investigated for, for something that, you know, is unsubstantiated and... I've never been, a, you know, charged with anything. It's just people just nitpick because they're not used to seeing someone of color that um, that is young and a woman, and and you know when you when you have the good old boy network up there, and and it's a lot of white men that have to listen to you. That's hard. Yeah, that's hard. Coming from Daniel Beach, we. We've come a very long way. You know, Jamie Beach used to have newspaper that have Confederate flags on it with a noose on it. You know, wow. we've had a lot of lawsuits from our public services department where our employees had to, our black employees had to park in the back. Wow. And so a lot of the changes that I've made to like fight discrimination and to make it a more equal playing field or a level playing field, that's not popular in our yeah. city. They expect you to be elected. And just shut up and do your job. And do your and job. That's not who I am. I'm I'm here to to make change. Yeah. And to well, make change in all of our communities. And sometimes that can be very unpopular. Yeah. Well, talking about making change, if you can give me a, just a, a quick list of some things uh, since taking over being a mayor, uh, being a former mayor, talk about some things that you you've changed in Daniel Beach uh, that has been impacted by you taking uh, taking that role with your team. Okay. Awesome. Um, so within our CRA, we have a um, first time home buyers program called At Home Dane Beach, where we provide up to $20,000 in down payment assistance um, for our residents. It is income restricted and it's only specific to the area that has slim and blight. So we don't want to build these homes, just anybody come get the homes. We yeah. want to provide that opportunity to lifelong residents, you know, um, to residents that are in the core of that community uh, to have the first dibs at, at those homes. And so we're able to do that. I introduced Ban the Box um, to our city. A lot of other cities were doing it and we hadn't done it. And a lot, you find a lot of times, you know, your employees are looking at um, a stack of, a stack of resumes like this, like, oh, okay, oh, oh felony, nope, automatically. And this could have been, a trespassing felony when you were 13 years of age that, wow. you know, follows our our black men and women for the rest of their lives. And so um, we now we ban the box. So we can't even ask you, have you ever been arrested? Wow. Uh, obviously, you have to pass a background check. But if, if you get to that level to where you saw my resume and you like what's on my resume, a mistake in the past that I paid for shouldn't hinder me from being able to get that opportunity. Absolutely. And so that's something that I was able to um, to do as well. An internship program. I brought an internship program to our city. Um, we have a lot of new development coming here because uh, of Daniel Point, where Grand Prix used to be or Boomers used to be. Um, we have a billion-dollar project that has employed a lot. I, I cut so many ribbons with that project because it employs a lot of it, it, it created a lot of jobs in our city and it also created a lot of revenues to our tax base. Um, so I was able to help approve and, and do a lot of those things. Um, I approved the Saratoga development, which is 170 affordable housing units. Wow. Um, and a certain amount goes to our seniors as well in our city because in America we have an affordable housing crisis. The prices are astronomical to live and to really to afford to afford to live down here. And so yeah. um, I approved that project, which uh, provided a lot of affordable housing to a lot of our residents here in our city. Um, I rebranded our city. You know, we are the first city in Broward County and we still look like it. And mm -hmm. so I'm like, no, I'm coming and give you a fresh, you know, we want to be a renaissance. So my, my goal was um, 
You know, people get go to pull out of the airport and they just drive right through Daniel Beach and go to Hollywood. They yeah. didn't even stop. It's not. It wasn't even a reason to stop. Correct. And so I rebranded our city, new logo, new theme, new Renaissance, new everything, and it. it's just it's just a fresh look. Um, Renourishing our beach uh, brought sand to the beach as well to to be able to. <laughs> Enjoy the beach, um, but you know, Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature wants to do. I approved the parks master plan, so our parks are antiquated. And you know, I had to go and play basketball in the city of Hollywood because we didn't have a basketball gym. We still don't have a basketball gym in our city. But I was able to unanimously um, pass a master plan that that gives you a guideline of of what our parks will look like in the future. You know, when we receive the funding. Um, Oh, that's how I do. Oh my gosh. That's a lot. Uh, that's a uh, lot. <laughs> we I created a position as athletic director position because we didn't have control of our sports in our community. And so I know that sports saved my life, and especially in that community. And so we had athletic directors to really bring a boost to all of our sports here in our city. And he's done an amazing job. Um we hired another CRA director, executive director, who, who brought a lot of programs and um, street festivals and just things for our city to do. It, yeah. It's such a short term. And so if you're really not focused, you will miss out. You know, you will spend your two years as mayor um, not really having that type of change. But the the object is to build consensus and to, to have your team support you to you know so you can change the policies or do the things that you want to do while you're in office and because i am a leader and and playing basketball taught me that you don't have to like your teammates but when we step on the court we we all have one mission one mission and for me in politics the biggest the biggest thing i see with people in politics is they don't know how to go to the next play yeah. so I may bring an item and someone may not vote for it, but for me, I don't take it personal. I'm like, okay, next play, I'm going to bring something else back. Yeah. I'm going to come stronger the next time. Oh, if I vote against someone, it's like the end of the world. Like, till they die, they're going to hate me. I'm just like, are you still mad? Like, next play, like, we, we have things that we have to do. Like, keep going, yeah. keep going. Yeah. And, you know, people are having, like, 30-year grudges. And, you know, I have six, 70-year-olds that hate each other up there. And I'm like, are we in high school? <laughs> and so being able to, you know, be the captain of that team and yeah. bring them all together. And like, look, we're not doing what's best for y'all. We're doing what's best for our residents. And and just having that position and, and letting them know, like, you don't have to like me, but we're going to work together. So yeah. you're going to have a miserable two years. Or we're going to make or it you... We're gonna make it work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, I'm not trying to wrap it up that quick, but we have a minute and 30 seconds. So I have one more question for you before we okay. close this off. Now, what advice would you give to professional athletes who are interested in being involved in politics? We make the best politicians because we, <laughs> we make the best politicians. We know how to work together. We know how to work with deadlines. We, we know what it takes to win. Um, <clears throat> and we have that voice. We, we have been advocates for ourselves since we've been kids. We know what it takes to be on a platform and to um, not only expect the best, but perform the best. And I, I think that because we are able to relate to so many different individuals, I think we make the best politicians. We're very passionate about what we do, and we're not taking a mess. Yeah. Well, there, there you go. There you go. <laughs> On episode 15, talking about the theme, talking about sports and politics with Sorry. Tamara James. Look, I appreciate you, you taking the time to come on. And uh, I'm I'm glad to to end off this season with a bang with you, and I wish you all the best in your endeavors. Uh, thanks again, Life After Sports Podcast with Kevin Johnson. Till next time. Peace. <laughs> Take care. Have a good night. I appreciate you. You too. All right.